Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Kevin Chen. We're going to be speaking about TED Talks and how Treehouse Eyes was first formed on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thanks again for joining us today. We are joined by Dr. Kevin Chan. It is good to have you. How are you, my man? Thanks, Dr. Kading, for having me for this podcast. I'm great. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here today. Well, it's an honor to have you. Anybody who's in the myopia world knows who you are and knows uh, knows the things that you've done. Why don't you give a little introduction of uh, what you do and uh, how you help uh, help patients with myopia? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm currently a senior clinical director at Treehouse Size. And before joining uh, Treehouse Size, I have uh, established my career about a decade ago. And originally, I graduated from the New England College of Optometry in Boston, Massachusetts, and then uh, also did a couple years of um, private practice before joining Treehouse Size, and then. At a point where you know um, I was at a crisscross road, whether I should dive into private practice doing primary eye care or something I want to you know dive into more specifically dealing with children. And interestingly enough, I never have you know imagined myself being in the pediatric world before. I never I did a rotation in pediatrics, but actually never thought about you know dive into my career in pediatrics specializing in myopia management. So that's kind of, you know, kind of interesting journey for me. Yeah. So I've been, you know, dealing with um, kids for in the past six years since we found Treehouse Size by, um, you know, as you know, co-founder Matt Erding and Dr. Garo Gerber. Yeah. So, Kevin, um, you know, I, I, these, are, these things just kind of end up happening, but how did that go about that Matt and Gary came to you and they had this practice and this idea how tell me about that conversation tell me about this formulation of bringing you on and having you kind of get get going with the practice in in you're in dc right you're in the dc area Mm -hmm. um kind of the flagship uh treehouse eyes practice right so Mm -hmm. tell us kind of how that all all went yeah, that's a quite interesting journey. And um, <laughs> when I first, when I was still in private practice, you know, I was an associate doctor at that time. And um, I was like many of you, you know, ODs doing, you know, uh, day in, day out primary eye care. And I may be fitting, you know, a couple of scleral lenses, doing a couple of low vision exam. And that's about it. And uh, I was, I was pretty burnt out at that time because I'm seeing a lot of patients every day. And uh, I'm sure you can share my burden as well. And uh, but at that time, I was asking myself the question, do I want to really, you know, do a nine to five job, you know, and take the paycheck home and that's about it? Or should I really um, dive into a different route, you know, make make a difference for the community? Spe- uh, specifically, I'm dealing with originally, I don't see a lot of t- kids, but then um, for some reason, you know, kids come find me, you know, at that part of practice. <laughs> and then I get more and more of those, those patients, you know, and gain the trust. And eventually, I have a really good foundation in pediatrics. And then one day, for some reason, you know, the Dr. Gary Gerber and contact me. And then we have a really casual, originally casual conversation and then dive it into more professional growth and stuff like that. As you know, she's a really, you know, good, you know, uh, veteran and consult on consultant. And so we talk about like, Kevin, what do you want to make a difference in your career? Do you think you want to, you know, take a deep dive into a different realm? Okay. In myopia management. And he put a disclaimer out there saying that, okay, right now I don't have a doctor's <laughs> in my office. You know, I only have an office, empty office. Would you like to join me? Mm. All right. That's how we all get started. 
and um, it's a pretty pretty intriguing experience. I never heard about uh, Gary at that time, and um, when he first found me, I was pretty starstruck, actually. Mm -hmm. But then, the more I know about him, the more interesting I found he is a cool guy. <laughs> He's he more cool than guy. just being a consultant. And uh, so at that time, you know, the rest is history. And then more interesting enough, when, when Dr. Gerber introduced me to Matt Erding, which is who is the co-founder of the practice, and I didn't know this guy either. And then we met up, have a, have a, have a dinner, and then I, I, really, I still vividly remember, you know, what Matt told me, you know, the first encounter we have when we have dinner. He said, okay, Kevin Chen, all right, I really know now, like, why Gary picked you as the guy for Treehouse Size. So at that time, I was really um, honored to hear that. And uh, because it's just a first encounter, I never know this person before, neither did he. So um, that was a really, I think it's a magical journey for me to how to get started with myopia. Yeah, yeah. So in this encounter, do you have any idea how Gary ended up seeking you out? Um, good question. I, I think it's just a matter of like, you know, someone know who is a six, you know, degree of uh, separation, you know, mm -hmm. that's how he found me and, you know, asked for my passion and interest in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward to the point where you've said yes to this position. You've mm -hmm. heard the vision, you've heard the dream. You walk into this empty office and, uh, you start this process. Where was the whole thing when you walked in the door? Were their pants or had they even conceptualized and, and put, a, put a space together with M room when you came in? Where, where were you at? Well, at that time, it was about six years ago. And when I first walked into the office, this was half furnished. And uh, we have some wallpaper, like treehouse wallpaper, but then nothing set in stone. I don't even have my topographer. I only have a slit lamp. It's pretty much like a primary care practice at that time. And um, obviously it wasn't prepared. You know, I need to, if I were to say yes to this position, I got to start my ground up. I need to build everything from, from uh, ground zero. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty interesting journey. I know, I, I know what I'm getting into <laughs> before signing up to this practice. And I know it's an entrepreneurship. And I know there's a lot of things I need to learn. I need to pick up because, you know, previously as an associate doctor, you know, it could be very easy. You know, it's a turnkey position. But then if you were to dive into something like uncharted territory, um, it was it was pretty nerve wracking, to be honest with you at that time. I don't know what my uh, future holds. You know, would I would I end up going back to the primary care, you know, um, being an associate doctor? I, I wasn't sure, you know. But at the same time, I also asked myself the same question, you know, Gary asked me, what do I want to do to make a difference for the community? Mm -hmm. So I end up, you know, take a deep dive, you know, um, even though there's a lot of hesitation and a lot of um, reservation as well, but then I end up, you know, go, go, go big. Otherwise, I'll go home. <laughs> So the beauty about Treehouse Eyes, uh, for those of you who who don't know a lot about it, is it's a it's it's a strategy, right? So Kevin and Gary and Matt they got together and they formed this practice and they put protocols into place and systems into place of how do we do myopia in a practice? And then now they've taken it out and, you know, other practices have joined up with them, uh, not a standalone myopia practice per se, but a standalone area in your own practice where they teach your team and they teach you and they teach all these ways and, and methods based upon a lot of what Kevin has gone through and, and Matt and Gary have conceptualized. So, Kevin, over the last six years, you've worked on protocols, you've come out with your second protocol, you've had collaborations and so forth. What would you say has been the journey to, uh, to really get you to the place that you can stand in, in front of people and do a TED Talk about myopia? <laughs> 
And, uh, and, and what are some things that you've learned over the last couple of years that maybe has made you more of a, a, a myopia hater than ever um, when it comes to this? And, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Like how, what are some things that have got you where you are today? Yeah, that's a really good question. And also ask, I'm really thankful for whatever I have been going through in the past six years from knowing nothing about myopia, simply seeing kids, you know, and prescribing glasses to now really establish myself to, um, you know, teach doctor how to do better for myopia management specifically in our ortho cave field, all right? And uh, so I'm really uh, grateful for all the opportunity, including what you said, you know, about TED Talk. That was another interesting journey, if I may, uh, yes. share a little bit about that transition, how I um, transitioned from clinical practice to being on the biggest stage on earth. <laughs> and that is unheard of. <laughs> so back then, you know, I think back in 2019, I was being approached by, um, an organizer at that time, he was running the TED, uh, TED Talk uh, forum in my area. It was based in Maryland, and then he he approached me one day. He knows something about contact lenses. He was kind of affiliated with some um, contact lens industry, and then he asked me, Kevin, do you want to try it out for the TED Talk? And I was like, really? <laughs> And I never heard about, you know, what, or I can imagine, you know, myself being on a big stage, you know, to be honest, I was actually quite an introvert and uh, I never imagined speaking in front of 10 people, let alone we're talking about thousands of people. And uh, at that time I was holding back. I have, I have second thought, you know, I wonder if this guy truly find the right guy to be on the podium. And, um, but Fast forward, you know, I, I said, you know, if I don't challenge myself at that time, I will never, you know, enrich myself. I will still stay on the same ground. So I, I, I try to achieve what I can and collect whatever I learned in the past few years. All right. And then prep, do a lot of prep work. You know, honestly, you know, I don't know how many rehearsals I have been going through during that uh, journey. And uh, I did multiple scripts and keep editing, revising. And eventually on the day of, I still remember April 16, 2019, that was the day of my TED talk. And it was prior to COVID obviously. And um, when I was up to the stage, I have, I couldn't see anyone <laughs> because the light blast on me. Well, you know? so, yeah. right, so right. it was Isn't like, it's different experience than on the podium. Oh, and, but in front of my, in front of me at that time, I was, I was actually uh, seeing thousands of people in the auditorium. And uh, mm -hmm. it was nerve-wracking, but also exhilarating as well. Because I never imagined I can talk about my passion in front of all the, all the stranger, all the lay person, including many of them that are actually parents. And vividly, I remember one specific incident after the, the TED Talk was the parent who uh, come to our, uh, the podium and uh, thank me for talking about this issue, mainly because she has been suffering from myopia for the past 20 some years. And then she says she wished, you know, she could have brought her daughter 20 years ago, you know, to see me so that she will have hope for her, her daughter. But now her daughter is now in college. So um, vision seems to be a bit more stable, but anyhow, I think the take home, the lesson I learned is that, you know, um, through this tech talk, I can actually make a difference and yeah. touches people hard, you know, uh, at the core. Well, the beauty about it is you spoke mm -hmm. to thousands of people that day, but you've spoken to thousands and thousands and thousands of more people with the TED mm -hmm. talk as it's been posted online. And so that's, that's pretty incredible to get big, been given that opportunity. Um, what, what has come of that? Have you seen that patients have come to see you in the practice because of the TED Talk? Have you seen any ramifications of that stardom that you've gained? Um, So-called, you know, I start to gain some traction since the TED Talk. I have more people uh, find me, you know, online. You know, I have a lot of, you know, uh, Google search. <laughs> um, so that, that drive the traffic a little bit more in the area. And um, like you said, many people actually heard about what TED Talk is. And when you see that, oh, this doctor actually be on the tech talk podium, all right? 
he must be having something to offer. You know, mm -hmm. I cannot say whether it's, you know, stardom or whatever, but I think, you know, they see it as a credential, you know, yeah. to, to offer something for the kids. Yeah, absolutely. So walk us through practice at this point. Tell us, um, tell us how your week works. You know, how does a myopia only practice operate? Yeah, so uh, unlike many other primary care practice, our practice is solely dedicated in myopia management. You know, my role here is to see patients from day in, day out, and we don't have a set day for any specific um, consultation. We try to allocate, you know, certain morning just for new consultation, mm -hmm. uh, see new prospective uh, family, whereas mm -hmm. probably the afternoon we'll dedicate more time for seeing regular routine follow-up for those existing um, patient, you know, including whether they're treated with ortho K or soft multifocal or atropine drop. And all the time, we also have a specific um, time dedicated for um, training patient how to put the lenses in. Yeah. Originally, I myself were the doctor, the technician, and everyone, you know, mm -hmm. we teach patient how to do it one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But as the practice keep growing exponentially, we can no longer afford to, you know, doctor doctor to do everything. So right now we are fortunate enough to have the uh, myopia counselor to help us out. All right. So she would de dedicate a time about 45 minutes up to an hour yeah. to spend time with the patient one on one, teach them how to, you know, do INR. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, uh, that's an incredible and important part of it because that's the thing that so many people fear mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, have so many questions about. So, Speaking of questions, how do you uh, how do you deal with uh, frequently asked questions at Treehouse Eyes? You know, we we all get the same questions about myopia mm -hmm. management, right? It, I can right. tell you ten of the ones that you get the most often because they're the mm -hmm. same ten that I get the most often. Mm -hmm. You know, is that something that you answer those questions, or do you have a myopia counselor or a technician that tends to answer those types of questions? Yeah, so we split our work in a you know different way. You know, I obviously would take the lead and answer most of the question you know that come up during the consultation, and then upon the examination, we'll also um, transfer the patient to speak to our myopia counselor to yeah. find out if there's any other uh, remaining question before they leave the office, and then if they decide to proceed with the treatment, great. You know, then we'll. I'll walk you through step by step, you know, even before they ask the question. And um, so that would actually help help them understand, you know, what what this treatment entails and what to expect. You know, set expectation is really key, as you know. Otherwise, you know, patient will be disappointed. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no doubt. Um, what uh, what would you say has been the most exciting thing for you in the last couple of years? And then what is the most exciting thing that you see happening in the myopia world in the next couple of years? Yeah, so that's a really um, big question. I think I will first um, address the first part, you know, what, what is the most um, exciting thing that I learned in the past couple of years? I think the feel is like they keep evolving, you know, the thing that we learned last week may no, no, no longer be applicable or simply we need to keep brushing it up, you know, updating ourselves, you know, based on uh, literature search and uh, talking to other colleagues. And one of the highlights that I found is that if any attendees, you know, have not attend the International Myopia Conference, the IMC, all right, I will highly, highly recommend you to join because that's actually my uh, first time uh, attending IMC this year. It was taking right? place in Netherlands, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was um, fortunate enough to share two of our poster um, uh, based on our clinical research in treehouse size. And uh, that was pretty eye-opening because not only do you interact with your local peeps, you know, you see people, uh, uh, that you have normally hang out with, but you also get a chance to speak to other international uh, renowned researcher and clinician, you know, all around the world. We actually have over 750 attendees across 33 uh, countries this year. Yeah, so that's, that's a groundbreaking number for, for this year. 
And um, um, another big highlight for me is that through this clinical research journey, you know, I learn a lot about myself and what I what can achieve more because um, this is something I never imagined myself doing. You know, I thought I would be a full time clinician. Right. But as, as the opportunity comes by, you know, you never want to say no. In fact, this is something that I want to keep challenging myself to explore some, you know, uncharted territory. You know, maybe I will become one day, you know, a full-time researcher get into academia. I'm not yeah. sure yet. Who knows? This yeah. is something that I will keep exploring myself and see what I can do in my realm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, to, to add on to that, what do you, what excites you about something you're going to be doing in clinic or something, you know, there was a point where you didn't do much axial length and that's become a big part of your practice, right? Mm -hmm. You know, ortho K we, 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 you know, one of the things I think is kind of exciting is spectacle lenses entering into the United States for, for that. That's going to change the game again for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a particular area or thing that you are excited about? Absolutely. I think, you know, based on our um, uh, observation and the, uh, my own experience in IMC is that the industry of uh, spectacle for myopia management is booming. Big. You know, there's a lot of um, research, you know, that uh, keep coming up every single week about spectacle. And the result is pretty exciting. You know, I cannot emphasize, you know, how, how many parents, you know, uh, ask me about, oh, is there any other alternative besides contact lenses? Because they're concerned about their kids being, you know, so sensitive or not ready for contact lenses. Yeah. And at that time, I wish I could provide more, but given the, the restriction in the United States, you know, it's not FDA approved. So that's why the spectacle is not yet available. But I think based on um, the journey that I, 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 I've been through and also what I'm looking forward to, I think Spectacle would hit big, you know, in the next couple of years. I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the biggest thing mm -hmm. in the next two to three years in myopia management. Well, awesome, my man. Anything that you've wanted to say to the masses and uh, <laughs> in closing here, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, I think I learned through my journey that, you know, never say no to the opportunity yeah. that you never encounter. I think many ODs, you know, especially when they're new to the field or just not sure whether they want to dive deep into myopia management. I think one of the biggest hurdles that I encounter with when I interact with other doctors is that they're not sure whether there's a, a return for, for their investment. And uh, sometimes they were so hesitant about myopia management, either because of taking too much time or uh, they cannot handle the kiss well enough or they're concerned about buying a new equipment, cannot afford it. You know, all these. Yeah, that's definitely a legitimate question. And um, I, I've been through this, you know, and I understand the dilemma, you know, you know, being an owner and how to juggle all these things in, in addition to primary care practice, I'm sure you know too. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, but I think the take home through my journey is that never say no to something that you never try. I know it sounds cliche, but I think from my experience, there's many, many things that I never imagined myself doing, end up doing. <laughs> and this is something that I think that's the beauty of, you know, in the industry. Um, sure. because there's so many unlimited opportunity, you know, yeah. including if you are listening, if you are a student or resident, and those are the opportunities that you never want to let go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though you may not end up doing, you know, but yeah. give it a try. Um, that's how I do it. And eventually I end up being in the field. All right. as my career. Yeah. And I think, you know, yeah. you, you bring that point up indefinitely mm -hmm. for, for individuals who are starting off in practice, but I always say, and I write about this all the time in, in, in articles that I write about how important mm -hmm. it is for us to step out of our comfort zone, right? Nothing great ever happened when you were comfortable, right? We didn't put a man on the moon. We weren't comfortable with that, right? We didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't take off to Mars when we were comfortable, but we're always mm -hmm. doing great things. And there always is that little bit of uncertainty, right? You can never plan 100% 
for how things are going to be. There's always an opportunity. And I think that it's really, really important for people to step out. And in, in, in the world of myopia, that is step out and fit your so first soft multifocal, right? Step out and figure out how to prescribe that first atropine. Step out and, you know, consider how do I go about doing orthokeratology for our patient. And like you and I are going to have to figure out, step out and write your prescri first prescription for spectacles uh, in that arena when they become available. So there's uh -huh. so many good points in what you made there of having to uh, step outside of your comfort zone and, and try something new, even if it's a TED talk, right? Not uh -huh. always get that awesome opportunity. Uh -huh. I'm glad you took it and uh, certainly have helped bring more awareness to myopia. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. a lot for being on the show, man. It's awesome to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. And thank, yeah. And, and, and thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Do me a favor and share this podcast with somebody you know. And uh, stay tuned next time for another great episode of the Myopia Podcast. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.